Okay, so it's it's one o'clock. I'm going to go ahead and start the session. So I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the second day of our virtual annual conference. I'm really happy that you could be here. Um, so I'm really pleased to, to first introduce uh, Dr. Samira Asma, who's the Assistant Director General for the WHO Division of Data Analytics and Delivery for Impact, DDI. Um, DDI has been a very strong partner of the University of Oslo, and uh, we have been um, working through a collaborating center agreement for several years now on innovations in health information system strengthening. So Samira, would you like to say a few words of hello? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, everyone who's joining from all parts of the world. I would like to begin by thanking University of Oslo, Christine and team doing a fantastic job. And WHO is truly fortunate to be partnering with University of Oslo in a very important piece of work that you are doing is to improve the routine health information systems, not with the intention of just collecting data or reporting the data from district to national levels, but in fact, focusing on how the data is used to improve performance of care, performance of services, uh, and regarding the patient as a VIP. Um, so I think that is going to be extremely important if we are truly serious uh, in our mission to achieve health for all, because primary, without primary health care, we will not be able to reach the promise of universal health coverage. The other aspect of, uh, the work that is important is how do we integrate the various uh, topic specific areas uh, on which the data is being collected in a number of countries. Uh, and yesterday, Marcus uh, presented um, impressive uh, statistics uh, in terms of countries, in terms of the people that are benefiting and accessing and tailoring, integrating, as well as um, using interoperable mechanisms uh, for DHIS2. Uh, so it is extremely important uh, how do we bring that integration together uh, because if we want to get at the country level um, improving the performance of essential services while we have topic specific areas of work that needs to get improved uh, we also need to make sure how this integrates in terms of giving a full picture um, of, of services of care. Uh, another point I want to make is as follows, that you and DHIS, using the DHIS2 platform, uh, were very quick in standing up uh, to the response for the pandemic. And the first ones, uh, where uh, that what you did in introducing the COVID mortality uh, surveillance tracker. Uh, it was difficult at the early stages of the pandemic to get a good uh, tracking of cases and, and deaths. And it's impressive to see how quickly DHIS2 as a platform can stand up to an emergency situation. And now you're doing that for vaccination. I would like to challenge us all to see how we can also introduce other packages that are not yet a part of DHIS2, such as NCD package um, and other uh, risk factors related to reducing uh, the burden of premature mortality due to NCDs. I think that is going to be extremely important as well as infectious diseases in countries that are facing the syndemic, as it is called now, the burden of infectious diseases, as well as the um, non-communicable diseases. Uh, from WHO's uh, perspective, we are placing a lot of focus in supporting countries strengthen their data and health information capacities. With the launch of the Score for Health data technical package, the optimizing routine health information systems is extremely important for WHO and we stand ready to support you, your work and countries um, and collaborate more closely 
with uh, University of Oslo and the partners. I also want to thank uh, the Director General who presented yesterday from NORAD and the support that NORAD is giving to this work, as well as to a number of countries um, in advancing this work to scale up. Finally, leave you with one thought. We have less than nine years away to meet the SDG 2030 agenda. We have already fallen back as a result of the pandemic. The time is now to get back on track and to accelerate the progress. Um, and we need to know how fast we should go and where we should plug in uh, investments. And without data, we will not be able to do so, nor improve the quality of care. So DHIS2 and your work becomes increasingly important and truly look forward to the um, uh, best practices that are emerging from the work that you're doing in the field so that WHO can amplify that and make it available as case uh, studies that can be replicated in other settings. So we look forward to amplify your work, your voice, and look forward to being uh, a part of this in person next time when um, Christine collects everyone uh, together. So count on WHO and our team for the, any support that you might need and look forward to continue working together. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Back over to you. Thank you, Samira. We, we just so appreciate the partnership uh, with the WHO and, and thank you for reminding us uh, that we still have challenges ahead to look ahead to uh, tracking and monitoring and achieving these SDGs in less than 10 years. So good for us to keep an eye on the prize. Um, I'm also really honored that another very uh, busy doctor has joined us today from WHO, Dr. Adlin Strand. Thank you so much. Um, she's the unit head for the essential program on immunization within the IVB department at WHO headquarters. And we've had the pleasure of engaging with Anne and the WHO UNICEF Innovations uh, for COVID-19 vaccine delivery working group over the last six months. Um, and it's enabled us to share the HISP approach for scaling up COVID-19 vaccine delivery systems in countries. Um, but we're also just really grateful to, to Anne and the colleagues at IVB and at WHO Afro for providing us technical guidance and inputs to the rapid development of these vaccine delivery packages. Um, they've been operationalized in 28 countries and we've learned so much through this partnership. So Anne Lindstrand, thank you so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Anne, I believe you're on mute. Can you check your microphone? There we are. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here um, because um, one of my hats right now is working to support countries on the country readiness and delivery within COVAX, within WHO. Um, so on the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Um, and in this, I've come across Rebecca and her team and the details too. Um, in a more close way than I've been before. And I am just amazed that, just like Sam Samira was saying, <clears throat> the reach, the depth, and the rapidity of reactiveness of, of the DHIS2 tools. Um, we, we hope and, and, and really are encouraging to expand on the different modules that are there. Um, and let me just go through a few slides uh, on where we are right now with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Uh, so narrowing down on, on all the, the modules that is actually available for uh, in DHIS2 into uh, what can DHIS2 uh, do for uh, the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. And how are we thinking in the work group that I'm uh, contributing to, which is called the innovation part of country readiness and delivery. Uh, but just a, a a step back. Uh, so our director general at the World Health Assembly very uh, recently actually called on our member states to do a massive push uh, to roll out even uh, more the COVID-19 vaccines and reach 10% by the end of September and 30% by the end of December. <clears throat> to some high income countries, these goals have already been passed and way, way passed. Uh, to other countries, and particularly low-income uh, countries, 
this is almost an unattainable goal if we continue with the rollout as is today. And um, so a sprint is needed um, and doses are needed. And just in the last couple of weeks, there has been a lot of commitments and engagement on the global scene for donating doses, uh, reaching and supporting the rollout of these essential tools, both vaccine uh, diagnostics and therapeutics and PPE, um, which is very encouraging uh, because uh, in all these fora, it's reiterated that to be able to stop this pandemic, we need to roll out these tools equitably across uh, the planet for us to be able to hinder and get us back into some kind of normality and the economy back on track. Um, <clears throat> so IMF, for example, did the calculation of 50 billion uh, US invested now will actually in the end uh, save us up to uh, three, three, nine trillion dollars uh, instead uh, in the future. So. A case for equity and equitable rollout. Um, and just to give us um, a hint on where we are at the moment on the rollout, 2.6 billion doses have already been rolled out. And 88 million of those uh, through the COVAX facility and had 231 participants. And this is increasing very soon. And um, so uh, the, this is the map of inequity where you have the lighter green is where the doses uh, administered per 100 population are still not at the level as in high income countries, which we really hope to change. And it needs to be a global commitment to how to do that. In the digital uh, or the innovate patient group, uh, we started, I think six months ago or something, uh, where we tried to look at what are the tools that can support countries to do the most efficient way of distributing the COVID-19 vaccines? What are the digital solutions that are needed uh, to support the health services during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? So the challenges is that you, we, we all know this now that particularly in low and middle income countries, but actually all countries, the health systems are under extreme pressure, both to respond to the pandemic, but also to, um, to monitor and to roll out the, the COVID-19 vaccine uh, at a never before seen sp speed and scale uh, of delivery uh, and this fast. So 2.6 billion already administered. Um, and that is a year and a half <clears throat> after <clears throat> the, um, the, 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 the genetic code of the virus was actually cracked. Just an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, but to really use the potential of these different tools that have the, the, the vaccines that have shown a very great success factor when it comes to efficacy and safety, and uh, the scale up is, is absolutely essential. And to do that as smart, as effectively as, as possible, I don't need to convince this audience that digital tool is really one way of being most efficient and be able to tailor uh, actions quickly um, uh, when, when it comes to the delivery of these, uh, of these systems. So what we did was come together, a group called the COVAX Innovation Working Group, uh, and it's a cross-partner organization. It's WHO, it's UNICEF, um, it's uh, Gavi, uh, BMGF, uh, World Bank, uh, Global Fund has joined. So we have, uh, it's a coordination call, you can say, of groups. And the first thing we did was, what are the tools that really we think are the most needed and how can we work on these uh, to improve them and advance them? And here are the, the tools that we then, uh, the seven tools that we said would be quite essential. And we have working groups, I mean, ongoing work in these different organizations towards these tools uh, has been uh, going on before and now uh, during the time that we have the innovation working group. So first of all, on the GIS and micro planning, super important to be able to map out the target groups and, and be able to reach them, do the micro planning of the best possible delivery. The second one is counterfeit and detection. And we've already seen how some um, uh, counterfeit vaccines 
have really damaged trust and demand for the vaccines uh, with uh, <clears throat> the solution being, uh, being able to have a barcode and track and trace and then also have a global trust repository for authenticity verification. Uh, it will start in UNICEF. Uh, it will probably lean over into WHO after that. The vaccine status, be able to track and have a proof of vaccination. That's the, uh, the smart card certificate, um, which is in uh, Samira's uh, work, I think. And then um, the vaccination monitoring. So have digital monitoring of doses given with rare digitized too is one of the key, key, key and most used solutions so far. On the safety monitoring, digitized too is also um, the, the module that is, um, is used by many countries, but not enough countries. We are really calling on our countries to use the safety monitoring tool that was developed in collaboration with the safety team at WHO. And because tracking and tracing these new vaccines is just so cru crucial. We need to get all the safety signals in hand to be able to advise countries about the safety signals coming up and what to know, know, do about them. There are also infodemic and then healthcare worker training that can use the e-learning platforms um, in, in a more efficient way. So all of these are uh, separate working groups. We come together and organize between ourselves. And some of the outputs from all of these working groups uh, are, are on this slide. So first of all, congratulations on the fantastic deployment of the DHIs too, through uh, regional webinars, through um, and the DHIs too centrally to be able to roll out in, in I don't know, even beyond 30 countries, I think now, these modules for vaccine monitoring and safety are, are out. <clears throat> and there is a setup of global adverse event digital monitoring. So uh, the streamlined standards and requirements for this. And many, uh, apart from DHIS2 to, to tools, have been uh, able to use these standards. There has been a stood up uh, UNICEF secretariat co-hosting a, 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 a digital health center excellence. And I'll come back to that later. Uh, we are working uh, to um, help um, the, uh, the su supporting global fund and Gavi uh, COVID-19 innovation funding through country awareness building and guidance on use of funds. So we're having global seminars to be able to push out the aligned funding that comes out that is now in focus from these big donors on innovation and digital tools. Uh, the Global Trust Repository, Smart Card Certificate, and then GSI, GIS enabled microplanning are some of the other accomplishments that are uh, have been in the making and are ongoing by the different teams uh, and contributing into the innovation group. So one of the first through, fruits, and I wanted to bring this to you, is the Digital Health Center of Excellence. So this is a UNICEF WHO co-hosted secretariat. UNICEF is running day by day, but in the funding discussions, they've had a lot of funding coming in lately to be able to coordinate, standardize the support to governments to uh, respond, uh, to particularly now looking at what are the mature digital technologies that can support health services delivery now in the context of the pandemic? Um, and then particularly the aligned donors and support governments to identify and apply for funding for deployment using costed investment cases. So these, uh, this digital health center of excellence have uh, many partners, not just WHO and UNICEF, but there is in-kind support from many of the donors uh, on the technical side, as well as on the funding side. And there, here you see the link to the DICE support. And uh, so it would be fantastic if, if you also in all your different network can make known this uh, way for countries, because we realize there are many tools out there and we wouldn't want to promote one over the other because countries can make their own choices. But sometimes it's good to have a vetted list with mature um, tested existing digital global goods 
that have evidence of being effective, to like, just like DHIS2, and, and then the support to the decision making can be done through this di uh, DICE, the Digital uh, Center of Ex Excellence. So that's what I wanted to say today. Uh, I um, am delighted to stay and listen in uh, today and tomorrow, and I, I'm deeply impressed by uh, the work of DHIS2, um, and I can see that it's, it's really contributing to the most efficient delivery of COVID-19 vaccine in its different uh, uh, modules that are existing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anne, so much for, for taking the time to join us and, and to really be able to frame the work of the community here um, within these just unprecedented uh, goals, how fast we've moved from a new emerging disease to, to a vaccine preventable disease and, and how are we going to get these preventive tools out there. Um, so our sessions today, they, um, they celebrate not only the innovations and the scale up for COVID-19 surveillance, which was a big focus of our conference last year, um, but also the huge improvements that have been made to the routine systems. So the routine surveillance systems, the mixing and matching of different data models uh, for emergency surveillance, routine, integrated BPD case-based surveillance. And then also on the flip side, now we do have uh, preventive tools. We have vaccines uh, to prevent COVID-19. And so now we've seen an unprecedented scale of these systems as well, moving towards um, COVID-19 vaccine delivery. And of course, this, this sits on the shoulders of years and years of work with the ministries of health through the DHIS2 community um, to really be able to strengthen these national immunization platforms. Um, so I'm very pleased for our plenary session today. Um, we have two, two um, representatives from, from countries that have made really impressive moves in this space. Um, so first I would like to introduce uh, Bridget Magoba, who will present for uh, Sierra Leone. She is a technical advisor, uh, public health informatics specialist with Athenet Sierra Leone. And Sierra Leone has strengthened the integrated case-based surveillance system and also integrated um, aspects of COVID-19 vaccine delivery, the vaccine tracker, as well as AEFI. So I'm very pleased to hand over to you, Bridget, to, to present on Sierra Leone's work. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Let me share my screen. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of um, Sierra Leone and the implementation of customizing um, the DHIS2 WHO package for COVID-19 vaccine data collection. Um, yeah, originally Sierra Leone already had uh, the integrated case-based disease surveillance system. And uh, this is what we expanded on to, to have um, COVID-19 um, incorporated into the system, which is on DHIS2 platform. And uh, since we already had this from the start of the pandemic, we had, uh, it, it collects a port of entry data of travelers coming in um, through air and through land. Then it also collects case-based surveillance data for, for other diseases, including COVID-19. It also collects um, contact line listing data and follow up data on quarantine and also case management outcome data. So we built on that and, um, and we're able to add the vaccine um, data collection tools as well. So um, we use it for data collection. At the same time, we have um, a visualization tools. Um, you can see an example of the charts and graphs that we have in the system from the different um, data sources that we have, um, including um, transmission chains and so on and so forth. So um, with the vaccine package, it, uh, we started in, in January 2021 when um, there was a strategic planning session and uh, we needed to demo how DHIS2 can be used to um, collect the COVID-19 vaccine data. And uh, the technical working group was amazed with how DHIS2 can be used to collect this data. So um, they were able to approve uh, DHIS2 for this, uh, for this purpose. So we went ahead and configured the system using the University of Oslo package. 
with um, specific customization in relation to what um, Sierra Leone wants. So then um, later on in March, we were able to um, conduct a simulation exercise and also um, launch the vaccine. Then um, up to date, data is being collected and um, analyzed and used to make um, informed decisions. So um, in the next slide where we shall have a look at the data flow, um, the system has the, uh, collects the individual registry data. It has the vaccine stock, um, the AFI, um, emergency drug stock management as well. It sends reminders to clients who are due for second dose. And also congratulation messages for those who have who have completed their um, their doses. So on the side of um, analysis, data is used to data is analyzed to to determine the vaccine uptake throughout the country. This is across all the districts, and also data is used to engage the social mobilization team to ensure that uh, the community is sensitized on on the importance of taking the vaccine as well as um, completing their doses, we're able to also monitor default defaulters and also um, share situation reports um, on the on those. Then um, this is the flow of 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 of, of the data, uh, the vaccine data. So um, the initial design was to have um, the pre-registration of all the priority groups. So um, as, as the previous slide, we looked at the patient level data, which is the vaccine registry and the aggregate data, which looks at the target population, the vaccine stock. So um, data is collected um, offline or using data bundles, but most of the, the, the sites do not have internet. So they collect data using tablets offline and then later on synchronize the data um, when they get connectivity. So, um, so as, as the previous slide, we have to send reminders to the, the, the vaccinees who have not yet returned for their second dose, and also those that are due um, for their second dose. Then AFI registration um, was incorporated into the vaccine registry program. Um, unlike the, the original design of the package was to have um, AFI separate from the, from the vaccine registry, but Sierra Leone preferred to have it as a stage integrated into the vaccine registry uh, program so that they can, we can keep, um, the, can keep monitoring the flow of, of um, one vaccine. Then um, data that, uh, that is um, collected is, is analyzed, we monitor for trends, uh, we use it for reporting to Africa CDC and also WHO in country and Afro and often for planning within the country by the National COVID-19 um, Task Force. Yeah, so um, we use the package to design um, the, the data collection tools. So um, we're able to come up with the data collection tools, the manual data collection tools as in the picture. And then um, these are the images of how the data is collected using the mobile application in the field at the different sites. So the achievements we have so far is that we've rolled out um, this system to over 36 static vaccination sites and uh, 18 mobile sites um, through a regional training that we conducted. And these sites um, cover across the 16 districts in the whole country with more sites um, in Freetown, which is the capital city. And uh, the vaccination process has been going on well. Um, however, it has taken longer than expected. The initial plan um, was that it would sort of be like um, a shorter time, but it has taken longer than expected. So the process is still ongoing since March. And each vaccination site has a dedicated data entry clerk um, who has a tablet. So it's easy to transfer the, the paper-based um, data into um, the tablet. The country prefers to have both uh, paper-based as well as um, the electronic. So we keep the paper-based as a, as a data quality for data quality checks. So um, yeah, we're able to integrate uh, the AFI stage into 
um, into the vaccine registry uh, program. However, we had uh, we first uh, challenges, it had a little bugs and we had to drop it and then later on had to incorporate it again. And so there were the AFI cases uh, kept accumulating and uh, there's a lot of backlog that is uh, being captured right now. So data is also analyzed regularly to monitor the vaccine uptake and uh, the technical working group sits every Monday and Thursday to review the data so that they can make decisions on um, following up the defaulters, um, assessing um, the uptake per region and also uptake by, by the priority groups and um, the, the different groups that have received the vaccine. So also situation reports um, are developed from the data and then um, they are disseminated uh, to different stakeholders um, across the country. And we also managed to um, incorporate the vaccine variables into the case investigation form so that we are able to keep track of any infections um, from vaccinated um, people. Then um, we have SMS reminders that are sent to clients to remind them for the second dose. This is an example of an SMS reminder which clearly states the, the, the vaccination site where you got your first your first dose, but also it, would, it, it is possible for um, vaccinees to receive um, their, their job from any other uh, vaccination site across the country. And these sites are always communicated through the uh, situation report that is disseminated across. So we also have the congratulation message, uh, which is very important and uh, has been motivating people to go for the vaccination. So. We always send uh, congratulation messages to people who have completed the, uh, their two doses. And uh, we have the manual vaccination card that has the unique ID, which is used to track um, the, the vaccine when they go back for the second dose um, through the electronic tool. Um, so we also had uh, uh, a smart card, a vaccination card. However, we had, uh, we first um, hardware challenges and were not able to implement it. So we maintained the manual vaccination card, which is in the image below. Then for capacity building, we were able to, um, to conduct trainings through the regional, uh, regional districts. Then uh, after that, due to um, less funding, we're not able to go on ground and keep um, supporting and mentoring the different vaccination teams on electronic data capture. So we had to come up with user manuals um, and also topic specific um, videos to explain how to go about capturing the second dose, explain how to go about capturing NAFI um, using the tablet and also troubleshooting videos were shared with the users to ensure that they're able to follow through um, any challenges that they face while using the system. Then uh, we've been having real-time user support. We have WhatsApp groups and uh, users normally make calls. So we are able to follow through any challenges that they face um, while using the system. We also had a hitch in the SMS uh, functionality, but eventually it was resolved. So for data use, we configured indicators. We, um, we used part of the indicators that come with a package, but uh, but also came up with other indicators that were requested by the EPI program and the Vaccine Technical Working Group. So these are the indicators that are routinely monitored and used to also, um, uh, they are put part of the uh, situation report that is disseminated regularly. So we have also an interactive dashboard for visual representation at the EOC and also the EPI program office so that they keep monitoring the trend and, and also the data, the vaccinations that are going on across the country from different regions. Um, we use smart display application for the, for the visualization. And also we do routine data cleanup um, at the district level so that the data is um, of quality. So this is the vaccine interactive dashboard um, that is used. To, to monitor the vaccinations across the country. Um, however, we had uh, a few challenges. One is uh, 
we could not get the pre-register key target groups due to um, an availability of the key information that we needed. So um, we did not do pre-registration from the start. So registration happens as of when vaccine uptake uh, by the priority groups and uh, which prompted the technical working group to, to, to lessen the, the, the age group to 30 and other people who are interested in taking the vaccine. Um, then data being captured on both paper and electronic makes work um, slower. So there's accumulation of the paper-based forms which, um, which reduces on the real-time reporting. Then we also faced um, a few hitches on the package where uh, we were getting bugs, especially on the AFI, um, AFI uh, program metadata. So, but we eventually resolved them and we were able to um, catch up with the data capture. Stock data is also not um, often captured as expected in the system because there is more focus that is put on the vaccine registry and uh, so for stock, you can hardly find any um, stock data in the system, however much um, the infrastructure is there, the system is set up and configured, but there are very few districts that report on the stock, which makes it difficult for national to keep track of the stock. Then um, there's parallel manual reporting. Um, sometimes the districts have to call in manually and uh, report on the numbers that have been vaccinated per day while they are still um, capturing data because of the paper-based um, backlog accumulation. So which, which, which makes it um, confusing for, for national in terms of relating DHIS2 and, and uh, the manual reporting. However, um, DHIS2 reports are what um, the, that is used for the situation report because it is, it is more reliable. So there are some districts that keep reporting the power um, manually. Then also the dependency on data bundles, um, the fact that they need to synchronize their data sent to the server and uh, the government has been loading um, data bundles on these tablets and at times um, that it, it is not loaded. And so uh, work keeps accumulating and so on. And also operational issues like some staff uh, strike because of non-payment and so on, which makes work um, difficult to go on. Then um, the next steps, we are planning to um, incorporate the Ebola vaccine data into the vaccine registry as a stage, so that we keep track of the health workers that have been vaccinated for both Ebola and um, COVID-19. Um, Sierra Leone is looking into this because uh, there have been an outbreak in Guinea, which is the neighboring country. So there was a scare of Ebola and uh, the border districts had to get their health workers vaccinated for Ebola. So that is one thing that we are looking into and uh, working, it is work in progress. And also you say USCDC is, um, is, is planning to conduct an evaluation on the, on the use of DHIS2 for COVID-19 AFI data management. So um, it will be good to go through this evaluation and uh, assess the findings. And also um, there's plan to integrate the AFI data into the Sierra Leone regulatory um, authority so that we are able to um, to communicate and have the same information into one place. And uh, we're also looking at ensuring that we that the relevant AFI data is uploaded to the WHO VG base, um, which is the global um, database. Um, then um, directly or indirectly have the, the vaccine the vaccine registry data for the for the international travels. Um, so we need to ensure that um, Sierra Leone vaccine passports are also recognized. Um, finally, um, as I started, this is incorporated in the case-based disease surveillance system, which is uh, the national database for COVID-19 data. And we are integrating so many other applications into it, like the travel portal data that is used for international travelers to register. Um, for their for their for their uh, COVID tests and so on and so forth. So we also have the quarantine site uh, monitoring data application and so many other sites. So um, we are looking at integrating most of these applications into 
um, the case-based disease surveillance system to have the data into a central um, database. Over, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bridget, for taking the time to share the amazing accomplishments uh, from Sierra Leone. I just think we have so much to learn about uh, how to use DHIS2 as an integrated platform and, and particularly your stories around being able to keep the data users in mind. And I just find it quite inspiring that the, the same data can be used by the EOC, by the EPI programs, and, and these types of things are what we're really aiming for. Um, so thank you, Bridget. And now we are going to uh, shift to our colleagues from HISP, uh, HISP Ethiopia, um, who have done impressive work on strengthening uh, the national surveillance system for COVID-19 with a number of local innovations and custom apps and, and real results to share around improving key bottlenecks such as uh, laboratory results turnaround time. Uh, so with this, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Sayed Hussein and Malika Serwit uh, from HISP Ethiopia to please share um, the learnings from the system. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Malika will be sharing the screen and uh, start. So uh, our, uh, our presentation is around the agility of the DHS to and how it is responded to our changing requirements. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, We'll be Malaka, as myself, and Abiot uh, from Oslo will be uh, in this presentation. So, uh, let me give you some background. The DHS was selected for COVID 19 surveillance and vaccination. Uh, currently, we are uh, customizing uh, the vaccination package and uh, we are on the piloting stage. Uh, it will be rolled out in the coming weeks. Uh, last year, uh, in the advent of COVID, uh, Emergency Operations Center. Uh, an EOC was established at Ethiopian Public Health Institute for Integrated COVID Response. Uh, in that uh, uh, center, a digitization section was established at the same time. Uh, DHS2 was handling case registration, sample collection, result notification, admission and discharge uh, through the tracker capture, and daily and weekly aggregate data were uh, captured uh, in infrastructure uh, supplies. So, Registration uh, was usually being done in the field using Android, but entering results in the tracker, app, especially on the web, was uh, proving cumbersome, and uh, it was not suitable for us during emergency. Uh, this was very evident, highly evident, during a month-long campaign last summer, whereby uh, thousands, in 20 to 30,000 uh, specimens were being collected in a, a specific day, and uh, they used to come mainly to the main at the South uh, Ethiopian uh, Public Health Institute's labs where four of the labs were uh, situated. So this lab, the Ethiopian Public Health Institute used to dispatch some of this uh, specimen to other labs in the city. So uh, this is when uh, we face some issues. So let me give you some background, uh, some figures, uh, and we'll uh, go to uh, specific things. So uh, until now, we have uh, collected uh, two, al almost 2 million specimens uh, of the tests, and uh, 950,000 people have been uh, communicated their test results. The SMS, we have developed uh, about four local apps to uh, cater to the local requirements, and we have trained more than 1,000 people uh, through the digitization uh, section team at the EKH. Next, please. The first uh, app we developed was the custom import export. As it usually happens, Excel templates are being uh, created and used to facilitate capture of data uh, by management uh, and other uh, people. So uh, uh, they are familiar with uh, this, uh, because familiar, people are familiar with Excel templates. So users in these the different sections of the AOC used to work with uh, Excel templates. So in the beginning, uh, results were being Build into Excel and then imported into DHS2, either one by one uh, or using uh, uh, by us uh, the development and customization team in bulk, uh, creating some custom scripts to import uh, into DHS. So, what we did first was uh, to uh, uh, align with the, these uh, uh, sections, to align with uh, the way they are working. We created uh, this custom import export tab. What it does is it generates uh, the test, uh, test, test uh, 
captured specimen uh, list uh, in a predefined Excel format. Uh, they used to enter uh, the test data there and we can uh, will import it. And it, it, it's still being used by uh, these uh, sections uh, because of familiarity sometimes. Next slide, please. So next, uh, once we did that was uh, people were uh, be start using start using the HS2, but uh, we have some problems. Uh, for instance, uh, staffs uh, and clerks at the, the, the decision section wanted to find TEIs easily and uh, like to see if a result is ready. Uh, and uh, because of issue with identifiers, because in Ethiopia we don't have a national ID, uh, we were using the specimen IDs uh, uh, that are collected during specimen collection. Uh, as identifiers. So to search for a specific TI using a specimen ID, which is captured in an event, program, in an event not in a TI, in an enrollment, uh, it was difficult for us to, to search. So result status tests were needed, but uh, we don't want we don't want people to see the results and uh, the latest specimen ID of a specific uh, person was needed in the custom uh, list of uh, the TI. But these were not possible because uh, pushing data from event to EI is difficult. It was difficult for us. Uh, and what the middle layer is pushes relevant data from latest test uh, event to the TES, the corresponding TES, which will be then visible from the customer. So what happened after this was the clerks will come to a specific organization in need and a custom uh, list will be displayed where they can see uh, the test result of a person, the specimen ID of a person, the latest specimen ID of a person because people will get tested more than one time. Uh, so this helped data managers identify uh, if there are errors, for instance. If there is an error capturing the latest specimen ID, it will not be visible in the custom list. Uh, so it will be uh, handled. After this, we, uh, because of uh, a surge of uh, specimens being collected every day, uh, we had another issue. Uh, so as I told you earlier, there was a Mandelung campaign uh, for COVID tests. So thousands of uh, specimens were coming to EPHA. So we developed uh, an app uh, uh, to handle uh, the surge of specimens coming to the EPHA. Uh, we found that the tracker capture was cumbersome to handle and it was not efficient for uh, uh, capturing data, especially if you are regarding a specific data, not uh, uh, more than one data. If you are capturing one data or two data, uh, opening the tracker capture app, going navigating to a specific event or creating a new event and editing data was being cumbersome. So we uh, we, are, uh, uh, we created this app. Uh, to act as a one-stop place to approve specimen for test, to distribute the specimen to specific laboratories and record test results. Uh, it's currently being used across all laboratories and uh, reception clerks all over the country, and result is also being captured by this app. What happens is uh, each specimen, uh, the team collection team brings the this batch of specimens uh, during like this time, uh, while I'm presenting, uh, teams are bringing their, their uh, day's work to the EPHI. And uh, during that time, during the, the campaign, what it used to be is there were, there were 20 teams uh, uh, wait, waiting for their turn to get for each specimen to be approved and sent to a specimen lab. So it was taking long time, sometimes hours to approve each specimen. So, at the laboratory, we created this app and what now they, are, they can do is, at the laboratories, uh, these clerks will select a specific organite where uh, this specimen came from, uh, the lab request form and uh, the laboratory to which they are going to send. Uh, and after that, they can scan each specimen one by one using the barcode and just approve. Since uh, there is a copy of, of the, bar, the barcode and a, and a paper format, it was easier for us to, uh, to scan and approve each specimen. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so what uh, this app specifically does is it will search for the last request uh, event and if this place uh, the event, the specific event, and if there is any problem, uh, it will show an error. So what the clerks at the reception will do is if it's a small error, they will rectify it themselves. If it's a big error, what they do is they will ask the teams to rectify the error. And they will approve each specimen one by one. Uh, the approval process will take only set terms. Uh, before the, this app, it will take uh, minutes to identify a specific key, open the event, and approve. Now it will take only seconds. This app also uh, was used to capture result data. So uh, the re relevant data from the uh, is, uh, sample collection event are being uh, collected and they are being pushed to the result event as well because they are needed for indicator calculation. So it will fetch some data from the test event, push it to the result event. And after that, what the clerk need to do is just enter the test result after scanning the barcode. Uh, I can demonstrate this in the next slides. Uh, this is what happens during uh, the approval process. As you can see, uh, the clerk at the reception will select uh, the organization you need. Then after that, it will select the program, uh, the surveillance program. After that, it will uh, select the stage here. We are handling two stages here. One is the request form, which is the sample collection form, and the other one is the result form, which will have you later. Uh, after that, what they will do is select the laboratory, this uh, specific batch of uh, specimens will be sent. Uh, after this, uh, what the app does is it will, uh, after selecting the number of days you want to uh, uh, fetch, it will list all the uh, specimens collected on a specific organization uh, for a number of days. After this, what the clerk will do is just scan the specimen ID, and uh, if, the, if it's ready, it will just approve. Uh, so what we can do is, uh, here as you can see, the first four steps, uh, including the days, it will take maybe an, a minute to load all the specimens collected for three or uh, four days. And after that, approving will be, be a matter of two seconds. Scan, approve, scan, approve, scan, approve. So this reduced the number of the, the time required to uh, approve and dispatch each specimen. And uh, people who used to wait for hours for the specimen uh, to be approved and sent to a specific laboratory, the teams now they used to wait only for minutes. Within 10 minutes, they can uh, get all their specimens approved and they can go on their way. Uh, next slide, slide, please. So we use the same up uh, to capture results so the, uh, yeah to to capture results as well the first four process five process are the same after that what the clerk will do is again scan the specimen id and after that just enter the result this especially used to take minutes for us because uh, using the tracker capture app uh, opening a specific ti and uh, after that opening the creating a new event result event entering the result dates, uh, other relevant data like the collection time, submission time, and after that, the result time, and at last, the actual result, it will, it will take minutes uh, to capture this. But using this app, it took only seconds to capture uh, the result. Uh, I'll show you some uh, uh, other uh, impact what we have. The impact of this uh, app is tremendous. It has Decrease the time needed to, up, to approve a test as well as capture the results to second instead of minutes. Sometimes it will take five minutes if, you, if, uh, if there is a connection. Uh, it has stopped uh, the need for bulk reporting uh, from the developer team. Uh, what we used to, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, when uh, the uh, results used to come in Excel templates, we have to clean the data, uh, map the data with the TEI, and uh, create an event using Excel and importing it, which, which will take hours. But now, using this app, uh, people at the laboratories uh, can capture their, their results themselves. It has helped us improve data quality as well. They are caught during data approval. 
the approval process. Uh, if there are any errors, I will catch them and it will be rectified uh, immediately. It copies relevant data from the sample collection event to the result event as well. It will, that will help us calculate uh, better indicators, as you can see in the uh, next slide, like the result turnaround time. Uh, so this is a sample uh, dashboard. Uh, it, it shows uh, result turnaround time. Uh, uh, that means the time between sample is collected and the result is issued. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, uh, visualizations that show uh, the result around the time for uh, going month, going back months. And uh, if there are any problems like the spike you are seeing here, it will be investigated and dealt with uh, by the digitization section. Next slide, please. This is a two-minute warning. Okay, thank you. I, I'll, I'll try to ask. The other app we created is a certification app. Uh, it's a public portal where relevant bodies can verify the value of any gated case. Uh, it's a standard kit which includes a QR for Formica. It was initially being used for discharge, but now uh, we have extended it to for uh, verification of travelers from anywhere in the world. People can go maybe to London and uh, when they are required by uh, the, the immigration agents there to show if they are if they are negative, they can look up in this public uh, portal. We are extending the same certification app for uh, vaccination. App. The other thing we do is uh, SMS notifications. Positive results are communicated via phone, a phone call, but each negative result is notified by two other person. Uh, so leadership wanted to see how many SMS communications have been sent to each individual. So we have a summary that sent that sent to leadership, including the minister, that includes number of SMS sent, delivered, rejected, and invalid call. Uh, the other thing we are doing is uh, integration with third party systems. Uh, there is a, a third party uh, app uh, developed by uh, other others that uh, there is a third party tool developed to assist self reporting by individuals. Whenever when was uh, there was a surge of uh, COVID cases, people were uh, started being treated at home. So they can, uh, there is a, an app developed to self assessment. Report. So data is pulled from this app into DHS2, and uh, we have created visualizations. The other uh, integration we are currently working on is uh, PCR machine integration. Uh, uh, TI and demand data will be sent to the PCR machine, and the PCR machine will uh, register the test result, and that data is again uh, pulled from the PCR machine to, into DHS. Uh, uh, final thoughts, uh, what we have seen is changing requirements and new challenges uh, have led us to uh, create innovative solutions fit for an emergency, like the uh, laboratory reception app, uh, the, uh, but uh, the his Utopia team working on, on the development, customization, and support is only to fit. Uh, we couldn't, we could have done more, but uh, it's we are <laughs> only two. But uh, one good uh, thing is there is a vibrant, uh, young, committed team and a strong leadership at the decision section at the AOC, which uh, relieved us from most of the routine in handling the reception app, the data management, the training, and other routines that has helped us uh, focus, for us uh, focus on, on other bigger tasks. And we have also seen strengthening local teams and creating uh, communities around them is very important to address uh, local environments. Uh, and we appreciate for leadership by the ministry in collaboration with other partners, uh, which has been just proven important as well. Uh, uh, in the name of all the people at the digital team, uh, all the young, vibrant mothers, uh, we thank you, uh, or as we, can, as we say in Amharic, thank you. Thank you, Sayed, and to all of our presenters at the plenary this morning. So we will quickly have to uh, transition to our next set of sessions. And we have um, really amazing country stories. Again, I can only say 
that I'm so humbled by, by the speed and scale at which the community has operationalized DHIS2 for these unprecedented demands and challenges with COVID-19 surveillance response vaccine delivery and also strengthening their routine system at the same time. So we will transition to the next set of sessions and we look forward to seeing you all throughout the day and on the community of practice. So thank you very much.